What I'm going to do is spend the next uh, 10 minutes or so just talking about another tumour that grows in the skeleton, and that's a disease called multiple myeloma. And multiple myeloma is one of the uh, tumours of, of, of your white blood cells. So these cells normally produce your antibodies, which help you fight infection and uh, are part of your immune system. But in some individuals, you can develop a, a cancer of these particular cells, and they develop in your skeleton. And we can see on this particular slide here examples of these tumour cells. And you can imagine if they grow in the skeleton, they're able to interact with the cells that control the behaviour of bone, namely osteoclasts and osteoblasts and the other cells in that environment. Now, one of the challenges with a disease like multiple myeloma is, is that these interactions have a very devastating effect on the skeleton. And you can see in the, the, the top left x-ray there, which is the skull of an individual with myeloma, you can see it has these sort of punched out osteolytic bone lesions, these little holes, and they call this a pepper pot skull. And the consequences in the, in the skull are probably less profound, but once you actually find these cells in the long bones or the vertebrae, you can see where, where the arrows are there, these uh, osteolytic lesions that develop in, the, in, in these particular bony sites. And the consequence of that is you increase your likelihood of having pathological fractures. So if you do develop multiple myeloma, certainly in the latter stages of the disease, the likelihood of having a fracture is probably 10 times what you would normally uh, experience. So it's critical that we understand how these tumour cells cause these changes to the skeleton. Now, over the last decade or so, we have made good understanding of how the tumour cells hijack the normal processes that go on in the skeleton that control our, our, our bones. They can in interact with osteoclasts to make more osteoclasts, make them more aggressive so they resorb more bone. But they also interact with osteoblasts and stop those cells repairing the bony damage that's been caused by the osteoclast. Now this in itself gives us some opportunities because we, can, we know from our studies in osteoporosis that there are drugs that are effective at stopping uh, osteoclastic bone resorption. And these are now the mainstay of treatment in diseases like multiple myeloma. But the challenge is with that is that this just stops the disease getting worse. It stops the, the bone disease from developing further. It doesn't replace the bone that's already been lost. So what, what, what our aspirations are are really to develop new treatments that actually replace the bone that's previously been resorbed. And one of the, one of the uh, approaches that we've been developing here in the, in the lab, and these are studies that have been led by Michelle, we heard from earlier, has been to develop strategies that block particular molecular pathways that exist almost exclusively in the skeleton. And on the right-hand side, you can see an example of that, where you can see a vertebrae where in the center there's a lot less bone. But if we use this particular treatment, and you can see in the bottom here, this is an anti-sclerosin antibody, um, we can see that this increases the amount of bone. And you can see the bone that is present is much thicker than you might imagine, than there would be in the normal situation. So this increases the strength of these particular vertebrae. So they're more resistant to, to fracture. And we're very excited about this development because whilst this has been undertaken in mouse models, we're now in a position where we hope to see this transition into the clinic in the next year or two. Now, whilst we're looking at treatments to treat the bone disease, probably the best way of stopping this developing in the first place is to really think about stopping the development of myeloma per se. So if we can stop the tumour growing in bone, we're not going to get the bone disease anyway. So that's really our, our aspiration. Now, the challenge with that is how do you find what are really rare cells? And Niall showed beautifully how important these cells are when they arrive in the skeleton, how they can sit in in sites within bone where they can hide away and then they get switched on to form actively growing cancers. Well, the challenge is really illustrated in this particular slide here. So this is a, just a, a histological section. So this is a slice taken through a piece of bone. Uh, you can see in the top part of this, this is, these are all the cells that make up your bone marrow. And you can see in the bottom left-hand side, the gray area, this is all the bone. And it's really at this interface where all the action happens. This is where your osteoclasts are, your osteoblasts. And what we now know is this is where the tumour cells are first to, delivered to. And once they're delivered to bone, they can enter this long-term dormant state. So they essentially go to sleep and require external signals to wake them up to form these actively growing uh, tumours. <coughs> 
But you can imagine the challenge of finding what is a single cell sitting on the bone surface uh, in, in an entire skeleton. So there could be very, very few of these cells that disseminate from a primary tumour into this site. And you can see the image on the right-hand side where it's blown up. You can see this single tumour cell sitting on the bone surface. So the question is, is how do we find what is essentially the, the real needle in the haystack? And this is where we've had to turn to much more sophisticated approaches. And, and much of this technology has been developed here at Garvin. And that is to start to use much more sophisticated imaging techniques that work at single cell resolution. So you can find individual single cells deep inside the skeleton. And this is really work that was pioneered by Michelle and Tree Fan in the immunology division, who have really uh, set the scene, really, and provided a framework in which we can now start to look deep inside the skeleton of living organisms, really for the very first time. And I don't think people can, we can underestimate the value of actually seeing these cells and then being able to understand how they interact with the cells that are around them. So on the right-hand side, what you can see here is a dormant cancer cell. So this is a cell that's been disseminated to the skeleton, uh, and it's sitting there on the bone surface, and it's essentially doing next to nothing. We can see that this is in a living organism. So this cell is a quiescent cell, and it might sit there for long, long periods of time. And in, in, uh, in a clinical situation, these cells can sit in the skeleton for years, maybe decades. And it's one of the reasons why tumours come back in your bone many years after successful treatment of the primary disease, for example, in prostate cancer or breast cancer. And what we can see in this particular example is a dormant tumour cell. The tumour cell is sitting there on the cell surface, and you'll see these green cells, which happen to be other cells, that come into this environment and are sitting there and move around and are doing a lot more uh, activity. Now, one of the things that we've learned over the last uh, year or, or two using this type of imaging and linking up the approaches that Michelle talked about is that we find that these cells, the osteoclasts that Michelle described, are one of the cells that are responsible for activating these dormant cancer cells. And they do this by, because they're involved in remodeling bone normally, they simply encounter a dormant cancer cells and they basically kick it out of the site where it normally resides and it then goes on to start to proliferate. So we can now use this new knowledge and this information to take some of the drugs that, uh, that you'll hear a little bit more about um, from Angela in a few moments and start to think about how we use these to stop osteoclasts affecting the behaviour of these dormant tumour cells. And can we shut this down as a process and keep cells in a dormant state long term so they don't get switched on and woken up to form actively growing tumours? And these are studies that we're sort of exploring at the moment. And then in the last minute, I just want to talk about what our real aspirations are. So these tumour cells are the cause of the disease. So what we really need to do is to be able to eradicate and kill these cells while they're dormant and sleeping inside the skeleton. So in order to do that, we've actually had to develop entirely new approaches to isolate these cells and work out all the genes that are switched on and control the behaviour of dormant cancer cells. And in a series of studies over the last year or so, we've now started to be able to develop that technology. It's working really beautifully, and we've identified a whole panel of genes that control the behavior of these cells. We can now target some of these uh, pathways, these, these particular genes, and we can show that this alters the behavior of dormant cancer cells. And we're starting to exploit that technology now with a view to being able to eradicate these cells once and for all. And the ultimate aim, of course, is to be able to kill these dormant cells. And if we can kill those cells, not only will we be able to cure these diseases like, such as multiple myeloma, but we'll be able to stop the development of the, the bone disease that is so typically associated with these tumours as well. Okay, so I'm going to... That's my ten minutes. I think I was ten minutes. <laughs>